Hey guys, it's Truthman from Overclocking TV and tonight we are in the OC show season 3 and that's the episode 11 I guess. Uh, so I'm uh, being joined tonight by only one person, our producer, uh, Timothée Xiala. How are you doing my friend? Oh, very good, thanks. And what about you Truth? Uh, it's all good. I got my voice back. So actually we had to cancel the show last week because I completely lost my voice. Uh, if you want to see what does uh, that does sounds like, you can just go on the uh, Facebook page of the OC show and uh, have a quite a, like a preview about that. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, a hilarious four video days. about it. <laughs> <clears throat> I was for four days without any voice. Uh, actually, a lot of my friends make, may, made fun of that. A lot of my coworkers made fun of that as well. Uh, yeah, well, they were I right think some of them so. were quite happy. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we had to cancel the show last week, uh, pretty much last minute, we tried to postpone for one day and then after that I was like, yeah, it's, n it's not coming back anyway, so we just completely postponed everything to this week and there's so many things that happened in just one week that we could have actually done two live shows, like one each week. Uh, there is a few reasons for that, uh, because there was IDF and there was the, some announcement by AMD, there was uh, some uh, competition finishing, there's a lot of things to talk tonight uh, and the main topics we will be talking about are uh, basically like what we like or didn't like this, uh, these past few weeks. Uh, all the latest update about the competitions, we're going to talk about IDF. If you have any question about what's going on or what did happen at IDF this year, just let us know. <clears throat> <laughs> on the live chat here uh, on uh, Twitch. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, still, uh, still have to kind of force my voice. <laughs> yeah, be careful. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit more as there's only Timothy and I tonight on, on the show. We will talk a little bit more about what are the overclockers doing in terms of videos. Uh, as you might have seen on the social media, there's more and more videos by the top overclockers or regular overclockers. And uh, we're going to just uh, have a little look about that. And of course, very important topic for us, very proud of it, the launch of the Open Bench Table that is officially launched today, early this morning. This is officially launched. Yes, finally, it's coming to the market. Finally, you can get one as well. And uh, we will have some discussion and uh, interview with uh, one of the designer of the bench table, uh, Shimon, later on in this show. So now I said, guys, if you have any questions, just let us know. I want to give a shout out to all the guys on the live chat. Mark0053 from Canada. Lil Chronic, Kingpin Kuning, that is actually Vince from Taiwan. Hey, guys, thank you uh, for sticking around. And uh, if you didn't add yet, you can go buy your colleague t-shirt they keep pushing it t-shirt uh, uh, yes, Timothée uh, where can we find all of them uh, so you can find the keep pu pushing it t-shirt there's a link uh, right under the twitch uh, video player so if you go to twitch.tv slash overclocking TV you just scroll down and there's a nice little link with the pictures of the t-shirt so you just click on it and that's about it yes well that's quite easy uh, actually we we didn't match up but we actually have the t-shirt from the LAN ETS. You had from last year and that from this year. And this is completely not uh, on purpose. Uh, actually, I, I kind of like this t-shirt as well. And I usually have the keep pushing it on me for the show. But uh, for tonight, I can't kinda have everything yeah, when you want you need to yeah. say. <laughs> I kind of like the blue one, though. The blue that the, uh, the, the, the keep pushing it in blue. That is kind of like the keep pushing it for the blue screen. Oh, I see, I see. <laughs> Mister has some taste. Uh, actually, this is what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, this one, is. exactly this one. So there's this one. Uh, you can actually pick colors. There's one cut for, for women as well. There's the hoodie. The hoodie is pretty pretty nice as well. I think, Truth, you have one of the hoodies, right? Uh, yeah, I have one. I think I have I think I have this color. Like this the color navy or blue? the more blue one? I think this I had one. the navy blue. No, no, I had the previous one. Not the, not the, the uh, electric one. blue. I might yeah. actually buy an extra one as the uh, the blue screen blue. The blue screen blue, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the electric blue. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's this one, I think. The, they call it Azure or something like that. Or, yeah, Azure. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the one. I was making fun actually about the name with the uh, Azure services from Microsoft when we <laughs> oh, actually right. picked up the <laughs> picked right, up right. the colors. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. All right, uh, Tim, there, there was a, a lot of stuff that did happen in the past, uh, actually in the past 10 days and actually in the past 15 days, in the past two weeks. Um, There's I always want to something talk about, happening, Truth. <laughs> yeah, but it's been crazy, man. There was ITF, there was so many th stuff that happened and we're going to uh, go a little, a little bit deeper into that. Uh, I want to highlight that AMD show up uh, some Zen CPU and demo. Uh, so let's face it, that was... Um, 
uh, a PR event. So basically, they invited press to show off what Zen can do, like the Zen Core, the upcoming next generation from AMD CPUs can do. Actually, it's not only the CPUs, it's uh, like processing units. Yeah, like yeah. They, will, they, they will decline it in many different things, apparently. Yeah, and they will all integrate IGP as well in, in there. Um, without going too much into the details, you can find all the microarchitecture details on Anantech by a super good article by uh, Jan Kutris. Uh, super detail Dr. goes Jan really... Kutris. Dr. Jan, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Dr. Jan. It really goes in, in deep into like uh, what was changing, what can be changed, what can be expected. Uh, how they uh, re um, rechange some of the uh, you know of the uh, architecture of the CPU itself. Uh, it's been long overdue for AMD to come up with something uh, new on the market. They are uh, clearly lacking behind in terms of high performances, and they announced basically that then will be AM4. So that we already know that for for some while. Uh, for a while, that will be completely new platform um, with uh, with the to actually to. Uh, propels the uh, the Zen uh, the Zen core on top. What is interesting for us is they did demo um, a rendering uh, workload, uh, comparing the core i7 6950X or 6900K. I can't remember exactly which one. Mm -hmm. One of the top core i7 on Broadwell E, and having the Zen CPU on on the side. So side by side. The Zen CPU appears to be a little bit faster. Uh, people are talking about 6% faster. But once again, there was a lot of... Uh, it, it's not a common benchmark they use. That's basically a load rendering of a 3D rendering files. So basically, it renders a 3D files and they say, oh, we compute faster. Yeah, but well, there's um, no way to yeah. compare if they use the same system, how they, uh, you know, if they did optimize something, especially for one CPU or not, or if they use special instructions and set, and that will maybe uh, be only for 3D rendering. Or that's why the press is for anyway, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why the press is for to investigate all that because you know before the launch, everyone has some nice slides. Especially AMD has become really good at doing nice slides since many years. Um, but in the end, uh, that Zen, uh, that Zen, they've been talking about it since a very long time already. We heard about that already at Computex. Uh, it's been over the summer being dragged along, and now it's kind of like officially announced. I mean, like if you look at the AMD stock, it's kind of ridiculous. Like if you would have been invested uh, investing in the stock, uh, let's say it's three months from now or even further than like well, actually, one year, a year from, year from now, now was actually was, a good yeah. spot because that was super duper cheap. And they, they gained above like more than 250% in value just yeah. uh, with the all the same thing. It's crazy. What yeah. we have to expect is I hope they don't go down after because they have to deliver stuff now. They, they promise high performances, they promise high efficiency, they promise a lot of stuff, a new platform and everything, but how are people ready to make the jump back to AMD again? I think uh, that's going to be the um, the key question here, Truth, and we'll see that in the next quarters, once the product actually hits the market and see if, uh, yeah, if people buy into AMD again, right? Because now Intel is really strong. Same on the graphics, you know, the same applies to, to VGAs, actually. It's been a while that AMD hasn't really delivered anything that is as strong as uh, what NVIDIA is pushing on the market. So um, it's going to be, yeah, they, they have to deliver or or it's not going to be very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but if you wanted to buy stocks, it's almost too late. Unless you believe uh, it's going to be even better. And then, yes. But this would be, that's almost like a five years high right now. Like if you So it's like a four one, times high. It's never been that high since like 2012. March like. 2012, yeah. So, so that's uh, that's actually quite impressive that they can come back. Actually, they changed as well the uh, the headquarter. So they are leaving the headquarter they had. Like the, uh, I think there was the... Like the one, one AMD. Oh, is that the one they sold and then rented? So that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard the story that they sold the building. They they rented back the building, and there was some so, like yeah. weird Something decision. Like if you if 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 you just like look at things, like you had a building and you just sold it. Maybe anyway, I don't have all the details, so I won't cash, I go like too much. Yeah, maybe yeah, they just needed some cash flow, and they are now moving to Santa Clara, so they will be super close from Nvidia and Intel. <laughs> Yeah, so everyone will be pretty much in the same <laughs> space, right? But maybe yeah. for them as well, it's a, it's a move to, um, as they reduce a lot in terms of uh, number of people, maybe that's a move for them to access um, other kind of knowledge or skills in, in people. Because there's a lot of people in the Silicon Valley 
uh, especially since uh, Intel have been laying off a lot of per, of, uh, of his staff, even though that was not on the same kind of business division, but still. There's yeah. a lot of things going on, actually, like... There's the, always the opportunities, AMD. no matter what, anyway. Yeah, I, I can't wait to, to be in three months from now and see what, uh, what then actually leaks out of that and, and see what can be done. Uh, I can't remember uh, when that's supposed to hit the market. I completely forgot that. Mm. So Firekiller well. is saying they, they were renting that office already since many, many years. So I agree. Yeah, it's probably quite a while already. Um, <laughs> so next news, Truth. Well. <laughs> Next news, uh, another news for new technology, um, uh, PCI Express 4, uh, this is completely new, that was not supposed to, I didn't want to talk about that first, but uh, that's going to be cool, like uh, it's supposed to have 16 giga transfer per second, that's supposed to be 32 gigs per second uh, transfer speed uh, for 16 lane um, a PCI Express connector, they are to, it's not final yet, so that's what they are aiming at. That's not what is on the market today. That's not something you can find on the market today at any point. Uh, they're still discussing on how long can the trace be on the motherboard. So how far from uh, the CPU can be the PCI Express load. That's basically how it translates. Um, you have a certain you know, uh, length you can do. And after that, you have to do like, a, they, they call that retimer. So it's a chip that actually get the, get the, um, like the electrical signal re how can i say that like repower it and just send it again so of course there's a uh, some micro latency involved in that but that's uh that's something we need to have if we have more than actually two pci express slot even on uh, pci express 3.3.0 uh, uh, version so yeah, yeah i PCI was express also hearing truth about that uh sorry they were talking um i don't know if it's true right i was hearing a news that uh, it would also remove the the need for power on some of the vgas like extra power so, input so a lot of press website uh, came up with the headline uh, PCI Express 4 will free uh, will free uh, power uh, power connector on graphic cards. I this is a little bit too much extrapolation on what you can do. Uh, what uh, the PCI Express uh, SIG, so the, the the group that managed the PCI Express uh, framework. I think it's because they uh, say in the PR it will be like they say it will be able to right? power 300 watts. That's exactly what it is. They say we can power. PCI Express yeah, things it's up from at least there. 300 watts at the slot. So yes, if you think about what we have today, that is uh, 75 watts or 150 watts for, uh, I can't remember, with all the RX 480 uh, uh, debates that happen, I think it's 50, uh, 750 watts. Maximum you can draw from the PCI Express slot. They say, oh, you can draw 300 watts. Well, the question is, maybe we're going to have uh, PCI Express tools that will draw more than that and that still needs the you know the extra power connector that's one thing the second thing is well if that draws from the motherboard the motherboard have to be able to be built to sustain that 300 watts at the slot oh, yeah, and i need think the that would be 300 lanes, watt for uh, one slot yeah. only i don't think that would be 300 watt for like five slot that would be just retardedly insane that's more than 1.5 kilowatts the only way to know is the way that the products are actually out with it but they say 2017, so that's next year. Uh, that's also the year where it's going to be Cabo Lake. Um, so, uh, yeah. That's not going to be on the market in 2017. Uh, the specification will be finalized oh, by finalized 2017. 2017. So yeah. we won't see any, uh, any official on the market product by at least a year and a half after that. So that means not even before the beginning of 2019. Yeah, because people have been worried, like, oh, yeah, if I buy a motherboard now, it's going to be a has-been in, you know, in X years, or maybe I will have to change PSU. Maybe the motherboards will come with a new connector as well, you know, to deliver that extra power somehow. The ADX24 pin has been quite old now. Yeah, yeah. But that well, would be a big know, change, right? It would be an interesting change. Like, uh, if, you f if you think about it, power on motherboards hasn't really evolved in it in quite a while already since the addition of the cpu power right <laughs> really <laughs> if you think about it but yeah actually that's uh, that's quite true um the thing with pci express 4 that will hit the market at the server level first uh, because that's where they actually need a lot of bandwidth uh, they need a lot of bandwidth for uh, multi-trading or multi-processor systems to exchange data uh the fastest they can this is actually one of the uh, most bo uh, biggest bottleneck in data centers today is the way they can transfer high uh, high load in between different uh, calculation nodes. If you can uh, say it this way, you can. can't wait for it. 
Yes. Oh, and they might change the connector. They say they might change the connector. It should be backward compatible with uh, uh, PCI Express 3.0 cards, add-in cards, but PCI Express 4.0 add-in cards should not fit in 3.0 cards. So, well, you should not have any issue once that's going to be on the market, but we still have at least a year and a half before that's actually happening to, to be a real concern for any one of us. Sure, yeah. So I'm going to move to my next news. <laughs> Yours? Because uh, I, yeah, I have one well, more after that. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you talk too much. Uh, so the, the next news, uh, <laughs> what I wanted to talk about is the World Tour because I'm directly involved with the organization. So I think it would be cool to, to share about it, especially since some, some guys on the chat have also been taking part to some of the events, especially uh, Mark, for example, um, or even Kingpin. So the one at Computex where, when he was around. Um, so basically the World Tour is hitting the next and final official stop of the World Tour, the final big stop. It's going to be in Indonesia this time and we will be at the Yogya Komtek. Uh, I hope I pronounce it well. It's a big trade show uh, on uh, one of the biggest islands. I think it's the Java Island in Indonesia. Uh, it's uh, not, uh, not in Jakarta, it's uh, Yogyakarta. That's how the city is called. That's the name Yogya Komtek. Um, we're hosting this event along uh, with the guys from Jagad Review. So um, they every year you, uh, used to host uh, what they call the AOCT, the Amateur Overclocking uh, Tournament. Um, and so what we are doing is that we are combining the World Tour with, with the event. So the whole amateur part of the World Tour is the AOCT. And uh, the, we are adding the World Series, so the extreme overclocking part to that event as well. Um, so the World Series doesn't change uh, for much. Um, it's pretty much the same benchmarks than, for example, the ones Mark, um, that's here on the chat, uh, was competing on uh, in, uh, in Montreal in, uh, in Canada. Um, it's going to be three benchmark for the qualifiers. Uh, once you qualify, top four goes to the final, and then uh, you draw out of six benchmarks uh, in your final and uh, your semifinals, bronze or final matches. Um, of course, uh, grand prize is a flight um, to uh, Berlin for the World Championship finals in December, and uh, there will be, of course, some hardware prizes and things like that. All that is uh, going to be announced in the next uh, few days as a. Uh, the final sponsors details are coming in, but uh, overall, it's all exciting. If you plan to attend the world tour uh, or you want to participate or take part in the amateur workshop, be aware that the amateur workshop uh, has the traditional AOCT ban list. Uh, so um, you have to not have been uh, in the top of any extreme overclocking competition. You cannot be extreme as well. Uh, all the kind of uh, Things. It's all detailed on the on the jagadoc.com website. So if you have any question about the ACT, you check it out. And for the World Series, it's open to everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're currently extreme or not yet extreme. There will be LN2 there, uh, people to help you out as well. And uh, and that's a good way to start. Chance, actually, yeah, there's yeah. there's going to be a lot of people that can help you out on finding like how you should do it, how you should insulate. Especially in Indonesia, yeah. you need to insulate. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's going to be pretty humid, so you might want to practice. Uh, one thing, the World Series is not just for Indonesian overclocker. It's the same than the, what happens at the other World Series and World Tour events. Anyone can fly over and participate. So if you're living around, uh, I mean, for example, Singapore, uh, Thailand, or uh, even China Australia? or Taiwan or yeah, Australia? Australia, why not? I mean, you can you can actually fly there. Uh, and yeah, just take a week off vacation and have a little overclocking tournament. Who knows? I'm okay with that. So you, everyone <laughs> is welcome. Uh, tickets, everything, uh, links are on HDBot. Just check out the news. Awesome. I can't, I can't wait to see that. Uh, everything will be live as well. Yes. I hear that For... you were coming through, so it's supposed to be live, right? <laughs> Well, if I'm coming and there's no lives, like, oh, yeah. What is he uh, even doing then? Be... <laughs> <laughs> People will complain that I take too many vacations. So, yeah, well, uh, no. I, I will be there to do the live and we will be doing um, a live update about, like, whatever, what is, what's going on. Even with the uh, amateur side, we'll try to see uh, what we can do for that. Uh, I can't wait to be there. That's going to be quite interesting to, uh, to see how the Indonesian... Uh, overclockers and uh, community is actually responding to this. Uh, it's a very enthusiastic community, truth. So I'm um, really, really looking forward for that event. It's going to be a lot of fun. And people are always nice. Always nice. Like, I don't know, like the, the, the Jagado Sea guys, 
always you know always here to help and uh, and explain to the new people uh, next news uh, that's completely something not related to totally actually not. not related I'm, I'm not taking any first. responsibilities here <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as you get my uh, my feel i've been uh, no um, talking what? a little bit more about Counter Strike. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna talk about Counter Strike. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, coming back to one of my uh, very old uh, love. Uh, that uh, maybe one of the few games I played when I was younger. Um, something that is not related to OC at first, but you will see why. Um, they updated rules uh, last last week. So actually, uh, I think that was like uh, on on Monday last week. There was a leak of an email from a CSGO developer to a major event organizer uh, that says, uh, we want to uh, re um, uh, restrict the games to have the coach to only be there four times during the game. So for you that, uh, that don't know how CSGO works, CSGO have five players and they have a coach for it. Uh, the issue is standing five. in the back, right? Yeah, usually standing in the back and uh, that's the person that gives a lot of inputs and and, uh, and strategic move to all the to all the teams. Uh, where they should go, if they should push, what they should buy, uh, we should drop the bomb to woo, etc, etc. So actually the gamer are focusing the more on the game and actually when you watch it, it's much more interesting to watch as well. Um, but by doing this, uh, the Valve still co still consider the coach as a six player, and if it's a six player, they're not allowed to talk to the to the guys at all the all the point in the game. They have to remain, uh, you know, have a distance in there to not be considered as a six player. So basically, what they did is they enforce, well, enforce they strongly suggested in a leak of email to some big event organizer to drop the coach in a way uh, that, uh, well, they will be only have four times, uh, four time out that are already scheduled in the game. Uh, before that, people can just call out timeouts at any strategic point when they want it. And uh, well, a uh, lot of uh, CSGO players were actually uh, not happy with that and really like, oh, this is not normal, etc. And this is where the point with the overclocking community come back. Um, this is the same thing that is happening, like similar thing that is happening with the HWBot revision seven, talking about the points, the point, the global point, all that, all the algorithm on about how to calculate the point. Uh, there is always good reason behind it. I don't see the good reason for Valve now because they didn't explain it. Uh, last time I checked, they didn't explain it yet. Uh, but if you want to check out the revision seven on HWBot, you can just go uh, in there. There's uh, actually um, an article of Massman explaining why the change is required and how the change uh, will be implemented. Uh, you still have the time to go there and uh, give some uh, some feedback about that. Uh, of course, it's very complex on how to calculate the point and how this uh, impact uh, the servers and uh, how the points are updated. But yeah, the, 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 the thing I, I get back from this story is Every time you do a change in a very enthusiastic and dedicated community, there will always be a lot of um, challenges explaining why you do the change and how the change will benefit the community long term. Something that Valve didn't do at all because that was a leaked email uh, versus what actually Peter did on HWBot for Revision 7. All right. That was my two cents. <laughs> it's your two cents. But guys, if you are into overclocking and actively participating, for sure, those threads are very important threads. It's uh, more or less the future. So if you have something to say, uh, better to say now. If you have something to say, be constructive about it as well. That's very important. Um, moving on, Truth, to the next topic. Uh, and we're going to briefly update you about uh, what's been happening in the in the competitions, right? Yeah. And it's been a lot of... Uh, lot of little changes let me find my uh, little <laughs> click click here i lost my window too many windows all right good. so we've got a lot of competitions still going on this uh, summer have be has been uh, how to say uh, fairly active uh, i think that's the least uh, we uh, we could say for now um what is uh, interesting in the competitions that have been closing is the rookie rumble number 34 um so this one is actually not yet closed uh it should still be a few days left or it's already over. I'm not sure. Um, so here we have uh, Hernandez uh, from Italy, uh, Rico from uh, Indonesia and Terracon from uh, from Germany. So what is cool, what I really like truth about the Rookie Rumble is that's where we start seeing the new names coming, right? Uh, most of the 
the newcomers, they pass through the Rookie Rumble and then they end up going uh, or the AMG Rookie or Rumble for that matter. That also exists. If you're into AMD, you can check it out. Uh, but then they end up in the Novice Nimble. That's where they discover team play. Uh, they usually enter a team. If you look at uh, the ranking of the teams here, it's very similar to actually the ranking of the teams that they should about. Uh, aside of uh, Coquitlan, which is uh, not in uh, necessarily the top 10 that they should about, but it's a very, very active team for They've always uh, been play. since the beginning. So yeah, it's, it's the a very of these, uh, uh, competitions. Yeah, yeah, very active forum. They help a lot the, the the novices to actually be performing in that in that specific competition. So we have overclock.net, uh, Cockatland. Uh, there are overclocking uh, Reddit team, uh, which is uh, led by uh, Belzoid. So uh, this one as well. If you are a big uh, Reddit fan and a Reddit user, and also into overclocking, you might want to check that one out. It's very cool. Uh, overclockers.com as well. Hardware.info, C team, overclockers.ua. So those are all very big team and also you can see here the novice of United States so this is an automated team that uh, HWO servers basically generate by themselves and um, that team basically uh, collects all the novices that have no team so they end up being all in one team and they're actually not doing that bad uh, so they have no team so they have a team now <laughs> so, so yeah they had no team so now they have a team congratulations to them but then again uh, the idea is to have them uh, you know a workout a strategy together uh, other competition that has been um, into the news for the whole summer, uh, the Team Cup 2016, uh, 71 teams uh, participating in that one. Uh, if we had to describe this competition, it's just the most epic competition of the year uh, with um, in terms of uh, participating teams and participating overclockers as well as results. Warp 9 system still in the lead, 992 points. I think overclock.net is actually catching up a little bit there, 728. Overclockers.com right behind 721. And then if you are into the other teams, you can check the ranking for yourself. Uh, see where your team are. It's actually a very, very tough competition. Uh, this year it's split in sub-competition for different types uh, of hardware depending of their age. So you have current generation, uh, modern generation, legacy, vintage, and dark pirate which is kind of a random package of things that were left. Um, so if you are into um, any of these categories, uh, check with your teammates and organize yourself to try to be competitive in that one. It's, it's, uh, there's no huge prizes to win, but it's basically glory because that's all what we are here for. Um, other competition that has been going and still ongoing, the MSI Godlike OC Season 2. Uh, every year MSI is hosting that competition, so that's the second year in a row. Um, Two battles, um, there's the extreme battle and the ambient one, ambient everything uh, that is below, uh, it has to be above, you know, above zero, etc. Uh, you have to be also in the, the first league that HDI bought, so I mean nothing extreme or non-apprentice. And then if you're into the extreme competition, you can also uh, do the extreme 2D battle. Here we have uh, Lumi from Finland, Bruno. Uh, uh, from Romania, Raf from Sweden, and uh, Dr. Wies number four, Hazan fifth. So you can see all the big players are in that competition. Um, some cool gear to win as well from MSI, uh, both for both ambient and the, the extreme. Uh, there's uh, basically prizes for the, all the top five, so including some cool goodie bags, uh, and I'm pretty sure we'll see some nice uh, MSI Dragon plushies there too, so it's gonna be, uh, yeah. I still don't have mine, I, 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 I might actually, it's too bad I can't participate in the in the competition, but I wish I could just you know, participate and get one of these plushies. Actually, I, yeah. would, I would rather get the plushie than the hardware. So if you're on the chat, let us know which one you're participating in, and if you are not, tell us the one that uh, you would like to participate to, even if you don't have the hardware, just pretend you would. Um, and uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe you know, maybe something will come and you will uh, find the, the right way to get the gear and be competitive about it. Actually, I would be surprised. Uh, I would be interested to know, Kingpin, if you are participating in any of those competitions, or if you would, which one would you choose, you know? Question, <laughs> open question, of course. There's uh, actually a, a, a good discussion going on between uh, Fire Killer and, uh, and Vince. Uh, Fire, is, uh, Fire Killer is always asking Vince, like, you no know, tricky question, like, oh, can you name that card in this way the next time? Or, oh, do you still do overclocking this way that you did before? It's like always the tricky question. <laughs> Uh, that's it's good. That's it's, uh, it's good. It's uh, yeah. you know the, the 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 world of overclocking is evolving. Everyone is changing also. Um, so I guess it, it's kind of interesting to hear what the what the 
uh, the either the legends or the top overclockers. You the, know, don't say the old them. guy. You will not no, be happy no, with not that. No, not the old guys. You know, <laughs> but, well, they're, they're old in terms of uh, longevity in the community, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, those guys have been around for a while. They've seen all the evolutions of both the hardware, the overclocking gear, and the overclocking scene in general. So uh, it's very interesting to hear feedback from them, and maybe uh, sometimes you can grab a few tips and tricks. Awesome. Yeah, it's been. Uh, we could actually do a two hour show just like on yeah. the evolution of overclocking. But we'll no, let's not later. do that tonight. IDF, next <laughs> Story <topic>. time. <laughs> no, no. Okay, IDF. Um, so, as you know, every year Intel is uh, holding its developer conference. So, Intel Developer Conference, IDF. Uh, there is one in San Francisco, then usually one in uh, Shenzhen in, mm-hmm. uh, in China. Uh, that's the occasion for, uh, for, for Intel to actually display what's coming, uh, what's coming up, the new. Uh, upcoming project, the new deal they have in the industry, uh, and basically what they they see this industry going or where they want it to go, uh, how they want to influence that. Uh, so the the direction, um, as always, there's always a keynote uh, by the uh, by the uh, Intel um, CEO, and uh, mm-hmm. there was a lot of uh, keywords thrown: the cloud, IoT, VR, autonomous cars, autonomous drones, holographic sensor. Ah, oh, a lot, of, a lot, a lot of uh, super keywords there. Um, they didn't speak that much about the CPU. They did hint at Kaby Lake, uh, that will be out uh, any few upcoming month. Uh, whatever the leak will, uh, the rumors will say. Um, there was another project, uh, something mm-hmm. that is called the project Alloy. Uh, that's an uh, autonomous VR headset uh, that is kind of mixed with uh, uh, like reality. Alloy? Double L L O Y. A L L O Y. Yeah. So yeah, they they had this. So it's basically like um like mm-hmm. yeah, like you can see on the screen, it's basically like a VR headset that is completely autonomous. Um, I guess they basically put uh like a embed system in there. The battery is actually in the back of the head. So you would have um, some kind of like a mini bricks or a mini uh, how is it called the the kind of thing that looks like a the nuke. Um, the NUC? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, the NUC or the one that yeah, has a straight uh, HDMI plug to it. Um, the I one can't you can remember. plug on the back of a monitor, for example, that we saw. Ah, computers. yeah, the compute stick. Yeah, compute stick. Maybe it's running on something like that, right? They didn't detail exactly what's uh, in there, except that it's uh, Intel, of course, uh, all Intel uh, made uh, hardware. Uh, it's supposed to be open as an open source system or actually open hardware, not open source, uh, open hardware system by next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, there was some you know, mix in between virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, they call that mixed reality. Uh, that's uh, just a personal opinion here, but I do think that this is just a step in between VR that is completely virtual and AR that is augmented reality. And I do believe that AR have much more potential to hit the markets and be a big change rather than VR. VR is just a VR, uh, virtual world, while AR is actually augmented reality on what you have. So you can go in the street and have extra layers of information or mm. ads or stuff like this. I'm actually surprised I, Google yeah. is not into that business that much. I think the, the key, uh, yeah, it's going to be wink, the mix wink. of both, like you said, Trif. it's going to be M- MR, you know, the, where you have both <laughs> virtual <laughs> and uh, real in the same mixed kind of uh, field. And uh, if you don't have to wear some ugly glasses and have a bad laptop in your backpack, I think that's already uh, already better. Uh, but I, I do like the HoloLens from uh, Microsoft a lot. The one that looks more like, you know, a pair of sunglasses. Uh, you know, and you just wear it and you get information on top of what you get. I think for this- me, that's that would be something more more useful. Then again, uh, if you have the whole, um, the whole like, uh, you know, virtual reality where it blocks you from everything around, that could be useful, for example, if you need to have, I don't know, 50 monitors around you or something like that. Um, Anyway, if VR gets so big, I would probably uh, not recommend for anyone to invest in large LCD screens anymore. Because wink, it's wink. Be, be gone very soon. <laughs> I mean, like really, if you can have any displays you want around you, uh, and in a kind of nice way on your on top of your head, why would you need so many monitors, like physical monitors anymore? Well, actually, you do have a VR headset at the office. Uh, yeah, we it? do have a HTC Vive. We tried it. Um, and uh, you know it lasted for as long as there were nice games to play. So yeah, we had fun for an hour or something. 
maybe two, uh, including setup time almost. Uh, the problem is that so, yeah, so the, the games are not there. So fifty-five minutes setup time I mean, like and five-minute games. <laughs> that's a, you know that's the thing, right? Like you, you can uh, you can play games with kind of like a kind of a VR-ish extension to it. So it takes real games and then you use your VR headset as sort of um, like a you know a command device that you will use your 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 pad or something, which you still need the pad to play them. And then you have this weird controller that comes with the vibe that you don't really know what to do with if you are going to play a more regular game because you're used to keyboard and mice or you're used to, you know, uh, like a like a gamepad and then you're you're like, oh yeah, what I'm, how, how am I going to do there? And the thing is the games are not really well, they're not designed for using two hands and moving your arms yet. Like, not yet. At least not if you play GTA V or if you want to play Crisis or if you want to play well, the any type more of modern game games. Anyway. Yeah. The, the games have to completely change or being created for it, for that kind of medium. Um, and also the vibe, you know, it's like, um, so it has this uh, webcam in front as well. You, the, you can tell the perimeter of the room as well, so you don't run into objects and things like that. Um, well, you so don't do nice. the exact same issue that you have Disciple ads. He yeah, yeah, a, yeah, you a small don't video break is breaking things, things like <laughs> hitting the screen or breaking that, the that's light. That's gonna happen for sure, like for for sure. Even here, like I mean, the ceiling is the office is not super super high. If you stretch, if I stretch my arm with the remote and would like throw something, I will definitely just smash the remote on that kind of piece of ceiling. I did actually like smash one of down. the remotes in the wall at a friend's place when I was in Taiwan when I tried it, and I was playing like a uh, cosmic trip, so you can yeah. uh, you know throw disc to uh, to kill like a. Uh, like uh, enemies coming and actually did throw like 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 a throw regular one and actually hit the wall there's actually like a small yeah. oh <laughs> well, a lot of those games right they're weird because you're holding you're holding this remote in your hand but you have to do a physical action with your arm but you can't do the physical action with your hand yeah i mean you can't let go of stuff right and this for the brain at least at the start, is very hard to understand. It's, like it's the same you. thing that happened like with Wii the Wii U. Yes. So you yeah. need that strap, and yes, you, you really need to make sure it's holding well. Uh, those remotes are actually probably not that cheap. They're uh, quite a high-tech kind of thing with the sensors and all that. Um, so yeah, I think as long as we don't have actually gloves, I I don't see the point like, of moving my arms if I cannot let go of my hands. Really, like no point. gloves with force feedback. Yeah. <laughs> That would I mean, be awesome. anything is possible and you can add electroshocks or whatever for you fancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure I want to play that game though. Uh, um, that was actually... cool. We can initiate people to virtual overclocking, you know. For those who are scared of doing LN2 overclocking, they can like do virtual overclocking, like virtual pouring and stuff to practice. Actually for teaching and training, would that be would cool, be awesome. Right? I mean, like anything educative with a VR is actually is going to be really cool. Well, uh, there was one game I really like on the Vive, that was Audio Shield. Did you add this one at the office? Uh, that, that's the I'm one you have. Like sure. you, you play your song, and it that generate like bullets coming through oh, you. It's and a you little have to bit like, like uh, the Guitar Hero, but VR. Uh, more like a Audio Surf. Okay. All right. No, I, I don't think I. Played uh, that this one. one is addictive because you're listening to the music and you're actually like, you know, protecting yourself from all the. Uh, no, the the bowl yeah. of waves. But the question coming. is, are we even speaking about IDF here? So serious yeah, question. Yeah, right. What what did Intel spoke about uh, at IDF truth in terms of uh, CPUs stuff we're interested in, uh, not VR uh, for example, uh, or gadgets, but uh, like actual. Is the there keynotes. any words being thrown around about you know key stuff like KB Lake or upcoming platforms? So KB Lake or... was mentioned during the keynotes. Uh, besides like autonomous VR, like the Jewel and all that. Um, uh, there was overclocking session at IDF. So IDF is not only the keynote, there's a lot of uh, sessions as well. Uh, there was a, a, key, a session by Dan Ragland from uh, the uh, uh, Enthusiast, uh, I think it's the Enthusiast group, I can't remember exactly which is the uh, the, the, the section he's, he's from. Uh, and there was uh, Elmore as a guest overclocker. And mm -hmm. that's something you have been able to see on the uh, HWBot website about uh, the... Um, uh, the the fastest 6950x CPU uh, that ever you no know, happened. So basically, Elmore was at the IDF overclocking that CPU during a session, talking about overclocking and the uh, you no know, uh, future of overclocking and state of overclocking seen by Intel there. But it was quite interesting to um, to see. I wish I could have the uh, recording of the uh, of the sessions to show you guys, but sadly there was uh, not was any. Was live stream this year? 
Uh, there was like only no, one left like, the yeah, keynote, and that was only on the yeah. Facebook page. Yeah. So I was actually trying to to look at the uh, at the live stream on their Twitch channel, but that uh, only happened on the Facebook channel and only for the keynote. So yeah, that's what you can see on the screen. And actually, that was the first time ever that the open bench table that you can see on the picture was shown in public. The final revision was shown in public for the first time at IDF this year. Hmm. Pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see if. Uh... If we'll hear more about uh, about CPU, I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot soon, more about Happy Lake in the next few few months. Yeah, uh, sure. I'm pretty sure there's gonna start to have leaks coming. I only heard uh, about mobile laptop related stuff uh, for now. Uh, you know, I'm still in the hopes of getting a MacBook Pro uh, at some point again with Happy Lake. So yeah, we, we had that because you know just before the Skylake the one is still not out and it's been. <laughs> it's they been will like not. They will not have any MacBook with Skylake in there. No, it's not going to happen. They, they won't late, release man. a new MacBook with uh, like almost end of life CPU. Funny fact, if they CPU. if they would release one, I would still buy one. <laughs> it would be painful, but I would still buy one because my my laptop <laughs> is dying and I just like too much Mac OS, and uh, I'm sold to the I OS. Can't believe you're saying not that. necessarily the hardware, but the OS. I really like it. Anyway, another debate for another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can last hours as well on this one. All right, uh, next topic: Overclockers video. Um, as you guys know, there's a. Uh, if you've been following Overclocking TV on social media, um, you have seen a lot of us reporting videos of people doing stuff, videos or live stream or uh, uh, you know um, uh, writing pieces of what they're doing with overclocking. Um, mm -hmm. The the first one I want to present is Doctor Wiz, uh, number one overclocker in South Africa, is actually. Um, uh, qualified for the HWBot World Championship later on this year, and he's streaming like almost, almost twice a week. Almost yeah. twice a week. So that's actually super, uh, super nice to to see. Is that you have like the the capture card, you have like the the cameras, and he's always explaining what he's doing. He's always answering people on the live chat as well. He's very dedicated over the one hour and a half or two hours stream session that he have. He always have like uh, you know uh, if you have question you can just go ask there and ask him like oh yeah like like this kind of tweak will this work or not and the last video we did publish I think that was like earlier that was on Monday right that was yesterday yeah. the uh, how to insulate the motherboard for extreme overclocking so that's basically using Vaseline and uh, and showing up like how you do it so what kind of toothbrush you use how it does. Uh, uh, how it, it does like spray like the Vaseline Very all around. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't look dirty at all. <laughs> and so yeah, he's doing a lot of things. If you want to uh, to see what he's doing more, you can check his uh, YouTube channel. Yep, his YouTube uh, channel. Or his Twitch page. Or his Facebook, Facebook page. Slash page. Uh, Facebook page, uh, Twitch uh, channel as well. And honestly, on the Twitch channel, I want to... Can you go back to one of the replay? Because sure. that's something we, yeah, on the bottom left of the screen, check this out. The system telemetry, that's the, he's using one of the prototype we made of the, um, of the special shield we have where you can get uh, temperature and voltage control. So basically you can just plug like a thermometer and have this on the stream. Uh, this was just a prototype. Uh, we sent it to him because actually he's <laughs> benching twice a week. So no, that's something we can uh, see for the feedback. Uh, Tim, do you want to update people about that project specifically? Oh yeah, I can. Um, I could almost. Uh, uh, it's in my backpack. It's a bit far away. Um, but um, basically, um, so this version is all using our Arduino as a baseboard and uh, some extension on there. Uh, we are building the new extension, which is going to be for Raspberry Pi. It's going to be a lot uh, faster. It's going to be also with more functionalities. Um, Again, same uh, same thing. Uh, two temperature sensors, maybe two voltage. Actually, yesterday I was already uh, looking at the specifications for the next version, and we might actually put be able to put four different voltage inputs as well. Um, so yeah, the new version is for Raspberry Pi, and uh, also the good thing with Raspberry Pi, the baseboard is a lot cheaper, so it's going to be a little bit easier to uh, actually. Um, for people to to buy this, uh, the device it said should should not be too expensive as well. So I think we'll try to to get it bundled for something like fifty to sixty US dollars, including uh, the Raspberry Pi plus the extension board. We'll see how we can do. 
Uh, but basically, you just connect both together. Uh, we'll uh, take care of the software to make it as easy as possible as well. We we'll design some kind basically of basically uh, plug uh, and play, right? Yeah, basically plug and play. We design some kind of web app where you can configure uh, the overlay, like you can see on the stream there. So you, you basically don't need to really code anything. It goes straight into your uh, open uh, OB OBS or whatever you use to uh, split or something, whatever you use to make your video, and it just displays pretty much straight like that on the screen. So you can use it for any kind of uh, live uh, monitoring etc it has the advantage of not being into your HDMI signal so if you want a completely clean signal um, that's also one way to do it also works when the system is shut down so has the advantage to uh, still have the readings and uh, temperature wise uh, it's uh, almost it's uh, faster than any fluke you can find on the market because the chips are just we're reading way faster than that and precision wise we are about 0 0.5 degrees off of a $600 fluke so with uh with yeah, not necessarily the best probes yeah. on the market <laughs> um so it's uh it's fair it's quite a, it's quite all right it's uh not bad i mean it might be actually a very cheap uh, multimeter temperature meter to, you, yeah. could, you could buy from the start because you can just uh, eventually plug a lcd monitor on top of that on top of your raspberry pi and then you have a, a multimeter with touchscreen or you can read actually this data from your smartphone so your smartphone can just be a screen as well just Live reading I can't wait awesome. to have very, the, very the new revision of the, on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be very cool. So that was for Dr. Wiz. Uh, go check it out. Uh, go give him a follow on all the stuff on uh, you know on uh, YouTube and Twitch. Uh, second one is a French guy. Uh, so most of you guys maybe didn't saw him before. He's called a Newell. He's from, uh, from French. He's uh, quite new to the game, actually. He started streaming recently. Uh, he's having a lot of time, so he's doing some uh, sometimes uh, game stream and sometimes overclocking stream, extreme overclocking streams. And uh, as a French guy, I was you know discussing with him uh, like I think that was like three weeks ago, and I, I just saw him like, hey, you know, how did you you know end up doing stream like this? And he was he was saying like, yeah, you know, I I saw the I saw the stream on the OCTV and says, you know, like the the you know the one versus one and all that. It's like. I, I found that was that was cool to see what people can do and talk with people. So I wanted to do the same, and that's how he picked up streaming. And I was like, "No, it can't be. You have to. You have to have no interest in hardware." It's like, "Yeah, I had before, but that was like, yeah, not that much." That's actually what bring him bring uh, him back into the into this and starting doing live stream. So that's cool. Good for him. Uh, we wish him to uh, continue like this uh, a little bit a uh, little bit longer. And uh, yeah, if you want, is a uh, Twitch channel, it's uh, N I U L L H, I think. Yeah. Uh, let me actually show you the, the screen again. This one. Yeah, that's it. N I U U L H. Um, <laughs> N I U L H. <laughs> so these are the like overclock, extreme overclocking focus stream. Uh, on Doctor Wish, anyone can watch. Uh, he already did um, like a, a rookie start uh, of the. Um, uh, yeah. of a stream so explaining people what to do and how to do it etc and answering very basic question as well uh someone that is a little bit different that tried to do extreme overclocking stream and uh gladly failed uh, it's Bill zoid uh, from uk he was doing a lot of uh he's doing a lot of videos and he's trying to do a lot more stream lately so let's hope that he can continue that as well uh and, he's doing and videos and i like i like yeah yeah go ahead go ahead and one thing I like in his in videos is doing the the paint job. He's explaining stuff with paint, and this is just awesome. I, I <laughs> honestly I just watch it and it's I just love. I just can't stop. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> Let me try actually to find a, a video so we can show you what it's like because it takes so a bit of that, imagination. Yeah. But yeah, and he explained a lot of the uh, power delivery system as well. So he's quite young, but still he's having like a a, a good background of uh, what he can do. So yeah, that's the paint job. He's yeah, explaining so... basically how to do vault mode using paint. Well, it's good. <laughs> it's mean like if you're if you're into uh, learning how that stuff works, it's a very good thing to 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 check. Uh, I wanted to add truth. If you guys are into uh, overclocking, want to stream more overclocking live on your own. 
Uh, and uh, you want to join the Twitch overclocking team. We have a team for just uh, overclockers that want to stream online for sure. Now it's just starting, so we are only two in there. Uh, but um, uh, Newell, if you want to join, uh, for example, if Mark, uh, you want to do more streams in the future, who knows? Or even you, Kim Ping, if you want to do some live streams, I would love to. I'm, sh I'm sure people would love to. It. You can join the team that's basically a place on Twitch where people can find all the channels that stream exclusively overclocking or as exclusive if as possible so it's just to make it a little bit uh, easier to find for people that would not know about it and things like that so just send us a message and we'll get you into the team as simple as yeah. that drop us a line and uh, let us know actually vince if you want to uh you know do some stream back because you did back in the days uh maybe not burning motherboard anymore but yeah just let us know if you uh, if you want to be a uh, part of the of of that uh, you know adventure per se all right so yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on in the overclocking scene. There's a lot of people starting to do content and proper content as well. Uh, that is super great. And you know, never, ne never stop. Just, just go for it. If you want to do content, explain stuff to people, even if you don't know everything, but you don't have to know everything, right? Just do it. Just do it because that's how it works, and that's just how do it, it is. Isn't that Nike? Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's not you McDonald's. Can't, you can't say that. No, it's McDonald's is just uh, come as you are, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, so right. final topic of the day, Truth, a big topic. Big the topic, big table. topic. The launch of the Open Bench Table project. Yes, finally, after a year and two months of development, it's finally on the market. So from the first time we had the idea of the project at uh, Computex 2015, actually the idea was in our head for quite some years already. Uh, but a discussion sparkle at uh, the Computex 2015 uh, with the guys from Stricom. And well, it worked out pretty well after prototype and so on. We now have the final product for, for this. So this is how it looks like when it's completely uh, bundled. So basically you can uh, transport that one into pretty much anywhere you want to go. Uh, um, you don't need any tools to mount it. You can mount a, uh, add uh, all-in-one coolers. You have a stand for the motherboard. You can just push the motherboard to it. You can fix the motherboard to it if you want. You can fix the PSU, you can fix the SSDs. Um, there is a rubber fit to not have it uh, scratch your table if you have a table or your wife is, uh, you bench in the kitchen and your wife doesn't want you to uh, scratch the table, stuff like this. <laughs> that could happen. I'm not sure know. that's one of the main use cases, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so basically like there, there was hours and hours and hours of, you know, reflection, design, brainstorming, back and forth. And we, we gather a lot of uh, prototyping from the community. So the community that's you know, part of you guys as well. I mean, all the feedback we got from the world tour got in, uh, you know, integrated into this uh, final version of the Open Bench Table project. Um, it's available now on the market. You can buy it now, you can buy it today. Uh, it's been selling for 149 uh, US. Uh, for the limited community edition, there's only 200 of them. There's only 200 pieces there's of the limited. There's not 200 left of them, Truth. No, there's only 200 <laughs> produce. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, uh, the limited edition, the one. limited community editions uh, is coming with an uh, extra travel sleeve. So that means you can actually travel with it and have like a, you know, like a house for, uh, housing for your, for your laptop. You have the same for for this special limited edition. And of course, there's a number on it, so that's gonna be super special uh, if you if you get one. Uh, go get one, that's gonna be a, um, an awesome way to show your support to this kind of project. Of course, uh, this project was made uh, available as between OCTV, HWBot, and Stricom. Um, the important is we did that for the community, we did that for the people to have you know, a solution for the bench tables, because the bench tables have been clunky, chunky, heavy, uh, super, I can't say ugly. Uh, it's uh, up to everyone's taste, uh, but it's there's there was always you know uh, lack of something or too much of something. Usually weight into that. Um, the final bench table that you have seen today is 1.82 kilograms, yeah. complete with all the screws and all it's that. The size it's of a 15 of, inch laptop, basically. Yeah, and it's uh, eight millimeter eight millimeter thick, and it's all aluminium. So it's like all you know, um, except the screws that are steel. But the uh, aluminium, like the body itself, is made out of one big piece of aluminium. 
So that's no super, you know, high uh, high quality work, and it's anodized, uh, like white uh, matte anodized. I can't exactly remember the exact name for it. Correct. I can't wait to have mine. I can't wait to receive mine. Yeah. So truth, we had a little talk with uh, Shimon, who's the guy uh, at Streetcom behind uh, the design of this table. Um, so we had a little 20 minutes uh, discussion with him where we explain, he explained us how the design process went and how the manufacturing process is. So that's a recorded interview, guys, that we recorded um, earlier last week. Uh, we were supposed to play it uh, when Truth had no voice, but um, anyway. So I was supposed end, we, to actually conduct that one. <laughs> yeah, so in the end, I did the interview with him. Uh, Shimon is a cool guy. Uh, he's behind the Great Firewall of China, so we couldn't get the video through, so we put a picture of him, but yeah, at least you would get a good idea of uh, who he is, uh, what he looks like, and uh, what kind of work he does. So uh, let's, let's just simply uh, listen to him. Okay, so welcome um, Shimon, um, welcome to this little interview. We are going to talk today about the, the open bench table and uh, your role into, uh, in this project uh, as a designer working for Streetcom. So quickly about uh, first introduce yourself and tell us who you are, what you're doing, where you live, things like that. Okay, so uh, first of all, hi Tim, thanks for, thanks for having me. So uh, my name is Shimon, I work for Streetcom as uh, I, uh, head of the design and manufacturing. So I'm based here in China and um, and yeah, my responsibility is, is basically to, to lead the company in terms of um, product direction and, and supervise the, the manufacturing and, and make sure that the products come out the, the way we want them to be. So about Streetcom itself, uh, since how long does the company exist? Uh, what does the company uh, do in terms of products? Uh, what it is known for in the, in the market? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that business? Sure. So Streetcom was actually originally set up in 2010. And um, I mean, the main products that, that people know us for, or even okay, the ones that don't know us, uh, we, you know, we're, we're a case company. But uh, we're, we're slightly different in the sense of, of where we focus. So I think a majority of case manufacturers, they do gaming, they do standard PC cases. and. And uh, nothing particularly special, um, but what we do is we, we focus on, on fanless, on compact. Uh, we're very design orientated. Uh, we're very focused on, on quality, so that the materials we work with um, and the processes we use, um, they're, they're very premium orientated. And, and it's a kind of more of lifestyle product rather than a typical PC enclosure. So that, that's really where we where we differentiate ourselves from the rest of the market, which tend to be, uh, I would say, may maybe more novelty-driven, uh, you know, des design trends rather than something which is uh, maybe more minimalistic and, and, and kind of timeless designs. That's what we do. So you're, you're trying to build basically uh, PC cases that, uh, that, are, uh, that, has a, that have a very simple design that people can have at home and that would stay at home and being used for years and years to come, right? Exactly, yes. And, and also, you know, we do have a uh, um, kind of focus on, on small form factor and uh, fanless. So, so we're trying to, to make the discreet rather than, you know, in your face with, you know, the typical gaming style and the LED lighting and so forth. It, it's a little bit more classy, maybe. Okay. Uh, so at Computex, I remember this year, right, you launched a case for Mini ITX, so since you were talking about uh, small cases. So that case uh, is like a cube, right? Um, yes, yes. The, so that's the exactly the type of product you guys are working on. Exactly. It's, uh, it, it's still a PC case, but, uh, you know, we think it's, it's different. And, and it's different in a way. It's not just for the sake of being different, but uh, to try and achieve something. So it is fanless. Uh, it does look like a piece of art, you know, it, it doesn't have that uh, generic uh, PC feel about it and, and that's what we're about. Okay, brilliant. Um, so since we are talking about Computex, that's actually where the whole Open Bench Table project sort of started. Uh, so that was back in uh, 2015, so that's the, um, the year where uh, Truthman, uh, so Isai and myself, we came to visit you guys on your Computex booth uh, that was in the 101 back then. Um, What was <clears throat> your first thought when you heard about uh, the project? Because uh, initially we were actually not there to talk about that. It just ended up being like, okay, about the discussion. Yeah, I, I think actually what happened was, uh, you know, you saw what we do. And uh, I, I'm assuming you thought, ah, actually, 
this is quite nice. Uh, wouldn't it be good if we could do uh, a bench table which had that similar kind of uh, quality and style about it? And uh, I think when you first mentioned the idea of um, of a, a bench table for portability, uh, well, to be honest, I'm not into the the whole overclocking scene. So uh, I, I initially thought I didn't realize you needed it to be portable, but okay. Uh, <laughs> and then my, my next reaction was, there must be something out there. And, and I think it was only after the meeting when, when I started uh, looking for what kind of products were available for overclocking. Uh, I think it's only at that point that I realized no one had really given any attention to this, uh, re regardless of the portability element, even, even the standard tables. Um, all of them, or the majority of them, seem to be just adapted uh, ATX cases without frames around them. So I think that's what really uh, interested me. It was uh, the fact that this hadn't really been tackled before, uh, certainly not using our approach or you know, the Streetcom way of, of trying to, to do something a little bit different and bring some you know, element of high quality to, to, to this. So I think, yeah, that's, that's what interested me in, in, in you know, starting this project with you. We are mentioning the design approach that, um, that Streetcom has and that is very particular to your products. Uh, what was the design process or the logic that went behind uh, uh, the, the, the design of this table? How did you approach the problem at first and how did you solve the different challenges? Well, well I think that actually uh, you know, the portability uh, and, and being lightweight, I think that works very well with the way we approach our design in general because because of the simplicity element. So once you um, simplify any product, you know, you, you have less components, you have, uh, in principle, less weight. So I think that's one of the elements that made it easy for us to, to come up with a solution. Um, and of course, the fact that we don't kind of add unnecessary complexity to it. So, so it can be simple, it can be uh, comprising of less parts. So, so exactly that's what leads to the to, to the weight and the portability. And of course, uh, using aluminium. So uh, it's it's extremely lightweight uh, metal. Uh, and of course, if it's if it's done right and you know how to engineer well with it, then it's also you know strong enough um, to support everything that, that that you need for a bench table. Okay, so when you, you started working on the project, the, so first you were mentioning you researched a bit the market to see what was out there. Uh, what was the next step basically following that? Okay, so I, I think at that point uh, our initial thought was, okay, uh, I think you need to, to define what it needs to do. So in, in terms of spec, you know, uh, what, what's, what's the type of motherboards it needs to support, PSU size it needs to support. Um, and then beyond that, I think it was really just down to, okay, uh, here's a blank piece of paper. This is, this is what it needs to do. Um, anything, can, you know, anything can be put down. And, and of course, the initial idea was it was a flat table. I, I think that's, that's obvious that it was, it was going to be something like that. But with the design process, what you normally need to, ha to have is, is the brief. And then I think it's a moment where you kind of have like a, the inspiration idea. So it, uh, it's not really sure when that happens, but, but you know, you hopefully it happens sooner rather than later. But I think at that point, um, you have a, an idea which makes that product uh, differentiates it or gives it its character. So for me, that was the point where um, with the feet and the handle. And I think that that has always been the defining characteristic of the, of the, pro of the, you know, of the bench table. Um, even if you compare the final product to the, to the early prototype, um, that element hasn't really changed. And, and I think that was the defining moment of the product, is, is to the, the, the feet layout, the, the shape of the feet, the way they fit into the table, and, and the carry handle. Um, so the, the very early prototypes were just uh, below 3 kilos. They were like 2.5 kilos. Um, and then the final one, the, the, the commercial bench table that exists on the market right now, uh, this one is 1.82 kilos. So what, uh, what went after the prototyping uh, into finalizing the, the, the final bench table? Uh, how come there was also so much weight loss as well? Uh, I think the key element to that was the fact that we committed to, to producing uh, a, a product as opposed to the prototype, which was, okay, we're, we're going to do a very low volume uh, and get feedback out. So 
when we when we really committed to to producing the product, there there was uh, the major change was the fact that we went from just standard off the shelf screws to custom screws, and by doing that, what it allowed us to to achieve was to to get rid of uh, all the additional parts. So, for example, the acryl, right? We had a this top and bottom acryl, which we used to create the compartments to store the screws. But because we have a completely custom screw set now, we were able to think, okay, how can we fix these custom screws without the need of, of extra parts to do that? Because they're superfluous, those parts. So that's, of course, when we thought about fitting them to the table directly to the feet. Um, and so that saved a lot of weight just from, just from those two acryl parts. Plus the, the screws that we had before, again, because they were not optimized, uh, they were heavier than, this, than the screw set we have now. So, so it's actually the, the, the acryl and, and the screws. Plus we do have a little bit more uh, CNC going on this table. So uh, we have reduced the, the, the amount of aluminum a little bit, but, but generally it was, was the change in design that, that saved the weight. Mm -hmm. So like you mentioned, the, the screws are quite special on that table, right? Um, what are the tools that are needed for someone that would buy a table and that want to assemble it? Does he need to have some screwdrivers or things like that? Uh, no, actually, uh, all the screws are, are, are thumb screws. So, unless you want to apply a little bit of extra pressure, uh, you know, to, to, to lock things in more securely, uh, you really don't need any, any tools to assemble it. Okay, that's pretty cool. So th those screws, uh, you can also use a screwdriver as well, like as well as being some screws. Oh uh, yes, you can. Yeah. You can okay. uh, if you want, if you choose to. Okay. So one of the next things about that table is that uh, initially uh, we had our we had that overclocking approach uh, into into why we were building this table. Uh, but of course, as we went, like we were also talking more about more. Uh, more like a regular people or PC enthusiasts, people that like to see their components on the tables or people on the field that would use the table as a regular testing stations and things like that. Uh, but for overclockers, one of the main concern was that the table would be solid enough to, to support a fully uh, extreme overclocked system, for example, with uh, one LN2 part on the CPU, four graphics card with their parts, uh, extra possible parts on the memory as well. Uh, so that would have been a very important load on the table and the heavy duty aspect was quite important. Uh, what uh, change and what made, uh, how do you choose the materials and the type of aluminium for that kind of use? Um, actually, that wasn't a very big concern for me, uh, the weight element, because I knew that we were going to be working with a, a fairly thick piece of aluminium to start with, just because, um, you know, even, okay, for example, even at, at four millimeters, aluminium is, is, is not going to bend on, unless you apply a fair amount of pressure to it. And I knew that, that we were going to be working with something more than that. So I wasn't so concerned about the, 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 the amount of weight that it had to support. Um, mm -hmm. the things that worry me were more the, the elements that we hadn't considered. So I always, always uh, as a designer, when, you, when you're producing any product, um, the, the problems that you know about are the, are the ones you don't need to worry about. It's the ones that you don't know about which were worrying me. So, so, um, so yeah, that wasn't a concern for me because I knew that we could test for it and, uh, and, and I knew that we were going to be working with at least eight millimeters. So I, you know, I was fairly confident that it would support anything that, that was put on top of it. Okay. Where, what were, for example, the things we, you didn't know about that you realized when you were working on the project? Or like maybe well, I, that we didn't have thought of, for example. Well, well, I think the the really big one, which was uh, very strange that we didn't consider that earlier, was the was the, uh, the brackets for mounting all in one. So, <laughs> so that was <laughs> That's really true, yeah. <laughs> that was a, a really big uh, a schoolboy error to have uh, omitted that on the prototype. But uh, but uh, at least it gave something uh, for people to look forward to. I think on on, on the final version, you know, that that we we uh, solved that problem. So speaking about those brackets, right? Um, are they cut out of the table itself, or is that uh, how do you get those uh, the material for it? Well, I think okay. Well, one of the other important things I'm not sure we, we mentioned it at all or enough was that that uh, you know we are going to put the plans online and, and the table. Uh, it, it's uh, you know if someone wants to has a CNC machine at home, I'm not sure how many people do, but but let's say people do have access to. To CNC machines, they can you know they can make their own table, 
And for those people who would who would uh, be milling it out of, of for themselves at home, um, yes, that those brackets they are actually cut out from from the the holes which are uh, also in the table. So the feet and and the brackets, everything for the table, other than the screws, everything comes from that single piece of aluminium. Um, Actually, for the production process that we're using now, uh, and this is just to, to speed things up, actually, and it's slightly more cost efficient, we are making the, the brackets out of a separate piece of aluminium, but it's still designed so that you could cut it out of that single piece. Okay, so P1, you basically will take those uh, those production brackets, for example, they will fit straight into where it's supposed to be cut off the table anyway, right? Exactly, the, the, the size and, and, and shape, everything is as if they were cut out from, from that point. And, and in fact, the, the early samples that we made, that, that's how it was done. Okay, uh, so for the manufacturing, you say you're using CNC. How does the, the, process, the process looks like? How does it work to, uh, to, yeah, to cut out a piece of aluminium and make a table out of it? Okay, so I think this is something else which would uh, maybe would be useful if we we, sh we add a video at some point but but to give a basic explanation um, you have already a, a pre-cut uh, slab of aluminium uh, already eight millimeters thick uh, and what you do is you you have a, a jig which locks it in place inside a CNC machine and the CNC basically is has an X and Y uh, cutting right as well as the Z which is the, the up and down so you have a, a different set of uh, 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 drill bits, and uh, what that does is, is, is it basically it moves the aluminium, and you have a high-speed drill, and, and that basically wherever the drill makes contact with the with the aluminium, that's that's where it gets cut. So depending on on the size of the drill bit and the position of the X and Y and the Z, uh, you know you, you basically just cut out the aluminium. Okay, um, so. That kind of, of tooling is not that easy for everyone to get, right? Uh, it's not something people typically have at home. <laughs> you don't buy that at the supermarket, <laughs> I mean. No, no, you don't. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, there, there are places that do have, uh, you know, milling machines available. And I have actually seen some uh, manufacturers looking at, at producing... Uh, maybe not large milling machines, but certainly small ones which are comparable to to three um, D printers. Mm, so yeah. I think it's you know maybe not in in the next year, but but certainly I, I think that there will come a time where um, you do have you know home milling machines, uh, and uh, in in that way it's something which could be uh, eventually produced at home even. Yeah. So for, for the production process and uh, the machine, for example, how many tables can a CNC machine do per day? How long does it take to cut every pieces out and have sort of the final cutout? Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult ex to give exact number because, because it's done in stages. So you wouldn't just have a, a beginning to end uh, in one machine in one go. So, so, uh, and again, this is more to do with just optimizing it for for manufacturing. But you would you would do several, pr you would do uh, a single process on on maybe a hundred tables, and then and then you would take it to the next uh, CNC machine and do an, another set of processes. And don't forget, because the the table right now, uh, and this is again a very big difference from the prototype. That the the prototype was only um, only had to be CNC'd on, on a single side. Uh, actually, two sides on 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 the top and bottom side. Mm -hmm. but with the addition of the brackets and the way that the screws fix, so so we have now um, CNCing on on all six sides. So you you know so you have to basically you know uh, stop the machine, uh, take out the the, the semi finished uh, you know aluminium, and then turn it to to a different angle, different position, and then and then do the other edges. So it's. It's a fairly intensive process if you're doing just one piece. Uh, so from being beginning to end, you, you would you know you have to start, stop, start, stop. So uh, in that way, we do a whole batch of, of one specific process, and then and then we'll uh, put it through the machine again and do do a, a, another process. So mm. it's uh, it's it's difficult to to quantify exactly how many you do in one day because you don't actually finish a single table in one day. Okay, I see. So. Yeah, so once it comes out of that machine, the aluminium still looks very, uh, very raw, right? It, it looks nothing like the table you get in the end. So what, 
uh, what does it get? What uh, what is uh, how do you get that final finish on the table? That that kind of uh, feel to the touch and the color, etc. Okay, so so after as you say, it's it's uh, it's raw aluminium. Uh, it does have a, a a lot of small marks on the on on the surface, so it's it's not perfect surface. So what we have to do after that is is first is to, to polish the surface from from any defects. So any any damage that can even happen in handling or putting into the CNC machine. You know this is a very common place where where you you get damage onto the the aluminium surface. So so first is to polish it to make sure that there are no defects. After that, the the process we use to to give it the final finish is a sandblast and anodizing. So the sandblasting it, it gives it that kind of slightly grainy uh, finish to it, uh, and you have different grades of, of sandblast. So the higher the number, the the, the, the more smooth the surface is, and the lower the number, the more grainy it is. So so we use it around 80 to 100 grain. Um, and that's sandblasted, and after the sandblast process, it's anodized. And the anodizing is uh, it's an e electrochemical process, and what that does is it basically oxidizes the surface. And what that does is it gives it the, the kind of final c color that it has, and, and it also hardens the surface so that it's uh, less prone to, to scratches and damage. Okay. So that anodizing process, uh, how does that work? Is that an electrical process or? Yes, yeah, electrochemical. So, so you, so you're basically passing a, a current through through the aluminium, and it's it's in an uh, it's in a bath of acid, and and it basically you have a, a cathode and an anode, and 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 so um, the 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 aluminium gets plated basically by mm -hmm. by that process. Okay, so that process is very similar to what you guys use on the regular Streetcom products, right? It is. It's it's actually it's the same finish that we use. Yes. Okay. Um, so, for example, um, now that the the project is uh, close to completion, with the production being uh, on the way and soon completed, um, how would you reflect back on this whole this whole open bench table project uh, to this point? Uh, it's been great, I think. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't speak for, from your perspective, but, but certainly for me, it's, uh, it's been a, a fun project. And I think uh, uh, what's, what's been great about it is the fact that, uh, you know, because we do other OEM projects and, you know, we do, we do products for other people. Um, but what was, was great about this is I think we had a real kind of openness about, about the project in general. So it was... Uh, uh, a lot of people they come to us with with very specific. Okay, you know they they virtually have the finished product. They just need us to make it. Whereas, whereas this was a this was a more a creative process. So it was uh, it was really fun to to explore it. And again, because you know it's it's not um it's not a market that we're in. You know bench tables. We haven't done that before. So it was a uh, it was fun to to learn learn the new things that we needed to know uh, to produce a product like this. Okay, well, we are looking forward to see how it does in the market and see what people say, because that's the most important, right? To would be to, to hear out was, uh, what the enthusiasts say, say about it. Of course, that, that's, uh, uh, it's, it's always gratifying to know uh, that, that people appreciate the product and, and, uh, and actually want to use it rather than just say, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. I put it on my shelf and, you know. Yes. <laughs> Especially the point of that table is for being used, right? So you unmount it, you remount it, change the systems on it. Um, we use Thanks. it here daily at the office already to, to test systems. So for sure, for, for us, it's been great, but it's even greater for people that buy it. It's great. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Shimon. I think uh, unless you have something else you would like to add or say, uh, that's about it for the question I had for you today. Uh. Nothing. Uh, nothing. I feel I can add to that. I think. Uh, I think we covered everything we needed to. All right. So thanks a lot for your time, and uh, we'll probably catch up and look if we can do maybe a, a little uh, production behind the scene video, maybe one day at some point. Who knows? Yeah, you're you're welcome to to come visit me here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Wow. Well, actually, that's the. That's the, the first time I actually hear that interview and see that interview. That's a lot of information that, well, thank you, Tim, for, for well, the interview. That was welcome. great. <laughs> We're going to put that on, uh, on, the, on the YouTube channel, I guess. 
Yeah, I like the way you explain like the the production, uh, how they do it as well, because I was always interested to uh, yeah, you know to to find out like how they do like the stuff on the side and uh, and all this. So yeah, that's actually a quite a complicated process in uh, in the way it's uh, no, it it is a complex process, but it's a uh, easy to use product in the end. So that uh, that was great. Uh, from just before we close on on your point of view, how was this project for you, Tim? Uh, well, it was great. Um, so like we said in the video, like it all started like um, Computex 2015. So it's been already quite some time. Uh, we, um, I really enjoyed the, the part where we started doing the first prototypes. Like really when we got it to the office here, like the very first one, we we're like, wow, it's really cool, you know. Then we used it all around the world in the, in the, in the world tour, like for the workshops. And um, like we, we were thinking like, you know, this is already very good. And uh, we, we actually like people a, wanted to buy the prototype. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> and uh, so we were like, OK, well, that's that's very good. And then we did uh, we met again with the, um, with the guys from um, uh, from Streetcom at Computex this year. But before that meeting, we had a we had basically a full two weeks of uh, feedback uh, revisioning kind of thing where we wrote down everything. We had uh, Skype calls with them, Skype calls with you, like uh, doing drawings and paint stuff and things like that to explain, you know, okay, this is, we could change that, we could do that. Uh, how about this? Is it possible to do things like that? I mean, like all the screws you see on this bench board, I custom made. Those screws don't exist anywhere else, like that kind it of stuff. They did not screws. exist before we made them, actually. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah, they're just, that's crazy. They're like just the push pin, they, there was some pushpin on the market but that's these ones are actually custom designed because that's the only one that could fit the requirement we had yeah so and then so then we didn't really hear about the project for a month and then we got the the revised prototype you know like we saw the picture we we're like wow it looks like even better like we could not imagine it was possible to make it even better but then when they actually arrived here like totally in love with it it was you it was, in your just, pants <laughs> well you know it's a uh, it's like um it's like when you're working on a project like this, you know, your eyes are so close to the project. And uh, like, well, that's where the, the magic of Shimon and the guys from Streetcom is really there is that even though the project, you know, they have their eyes on it as well. Like every, when they reiterated the product to make the final version, uh, it almost looked like the completely different one. Like it's the same base. Yeah, it's, so much it's rework completely, on it. Like, yeah, it's very different from whatever it was before. And you will see, like, we, we did some small markings on the sides for indicating which screws goes where. Like, there's some hidden things about the tables that was that people will have to discover by themselves. So it's it's some uh, really a lot of work and time has been pen, spent into that product. And I really hope that those that will buy it will actually really enjoy it. So, yeah, I'm really happy about it. As simple as that. Yeah, that's, that, that, was a, that was a very nice project to, uh, to do and follow up and... Uh, no, even though like the team was completely spread around the world, uh, there was uh, you guys in Taiwan, me here in Canada. Uh, there was one guy in the uh, uh, Netherlands and uh, Shimon in China. So these these actually prove that actually the the guys to come of uh, strong, you know, uh, you no know, capabilities in design it was actually super interesting to design with them, especially on the production side because we had we had some ideas and they were saying like like yes we we could do it but that will not be efficient in a way of producing it. And actually there was always like twist around to make the, the, the things we wanted to have and make it you know, interesting and actually solid enough for the requirement that we had. I think like the, the PSU is like 10, 10 kg, the rating that we had. That's uh, how, how much you can like, I, I was yeah. holding uh, the, 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 the table by the handle in the world tour to move around tables and uh, moving the rigs around. So with the whole PC mounted to it, just grabbing the table by the handle, which I actually don't recommend to do uh, because you have all the cables and you <laughs> may get stuck into things. But uh, basically it, it holds all together and uh, like the PSU, you can, yeah, you can put many kilos on there. It's uh, like aluminium, once it's thick, it's really, really strong, very strong, very strong. Now, one thing as well that people might not know is we change the kind of aluminium just before the final uh, production. We took actually a stronger one as well. Yeah, so like um, uh, it used to be made from the same aluminium Streetcom is uh, using, so the same grade of aluminium used by Streetcom to uh, to make their own products. And the key things about Streetcom's product, like Shimon was explaining, is that are passively cooled uh, cases. So basically, you have the old radiator, uh, the the cool the, the the pipes, and those are connected to the outside of the case, and the case is the radiator itself. Um, now, so this aluminium, this grading is really good for heat dissipation. That's why they use it. 
um, but now we need we don't care like I mean like the point here is not to we're not going to be PC, using right? that for passive cooling anyway because you have LN2 pods for that or if you're using at home anyway this there's no contact with the hardware with this kind of table so you it's not going to cool down anything so basically we uh, we changed the grade of aluminium to uh, the strongest they had that we could get so it's uh, basically a very heavy duty aluminium it's much harder much more solid um, so if you thought the previous one was already solid this one will be even more and this is good because it's going to help also for the screws uh, where we have the, the threadings as well it's going to make them more durable in time as well um, so it's going to be uh, perfect well uh, i can't wait to get i can't wait to get my hand on mine uh, if you guys want one and you should actually get one if you like this kind of project to uh, support us to make maybe uh, other projects like this in the near future go buy your community li uh, limited community edition uh, you get the bench table and the traveler sleeve uh, there's only 200 pieces that have been produced there's less than that that are available now so go buy yours it's uh, available right now uh, on openbenchtable.com for 149 us and uh, and yes, uh, send us the uh, the picture once uh, you're gonna see. Uh, Tim, I heard that you're doing a lot of update about uh, where we are in the production and so on. Uh, yeah. All that can be found on the Facebook page. Yeah, of the either the vegetable. Facebook page or if you purchase one, you actually get emails directly from me to tell you what's the status. So, and uh, we also have a newsletter on the website. So if you guys want to uh, know where the project is or when the retail versions come out or when, uh, whenever, you know, sometimes like we send discount codes for the very early uh, people that uh, supported the projects. So if you want to get all that goodies eventually or things like that or follow simply the project, um, just subscribe to the newsletter. We also let you know in September, like we, like we mentioned in the video, we'll put the blueprints up. So if you want already or have ex ideas of accessories you would like to build for it, uh, there's many accessories we can do. For example, out of nowhere, for example, uh, some uh, adaptator for uh, putting SFX PSUs on there or whatever other things you could uh, 3D print and using the different holes that are already made on the frame of the table. Well, then those blueprints will be very useful. And then if you have a CNC, like Shimon said, you're free to to, to try to make your own table as well. <laughs> yeah, we all have a CNC at home. <laughs> Some people have. Oh, maybe one day. Or a 3D printer. That will take longer, yeah. but yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for the interview. Thanks for your time tonight. That was a quite long OT show, one hour and a half. Uh, thank you guys for being there with us tonight. That was the OC Show Season 3, Episode 11. And we will catch you back next week or actually in the next few weeks uh, because in a week, actually next week next, and next half, week, in two weeks, we're going to be in uh, Indonesia. In two weeks, we'll be we live uh, pretty much every day <laughs> for uh, the HWBot World Tour 2016 Asia leg. That's the last uh, qualifier that can happen before the HWBot World Championship in Berlin in early December. Timothée, yes. the word for the end. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Uh, like us on Facebook if you don't already. You can also subscribe to live video updates as well on Facebook. It's not very well indicated, but in the, at the top of the player, you have a little button there. So just uh, click to that like this. You know every time we are live. Um, otherwise, uh, don't forget, keep pushing it.